Typically, the study of warfare beyond just the early modern period has far too often been dominated by large reputations and conceptions, narrowly sectioning off wars as religious, barbaric or not violent. And in attempting to marry such large ideas of warfare with an in-depth study of the civilian figure, is certainly not a straightforward task and is often produced a dogged imbalance. Recent shifts have been made amongst historians such as Jeff Mortimer, Charles Carlton and John Lynn to focus in on early modern Europe and the awful violence civilians face through eyewitness accounts and prints. But not enough attention has been paid to the actual complexity of the terms warfare and civilian and the problems we're faced with when attempting to explore them. For example, the term warfare itself is an ever-changing process that is dependent on what form it takes. Additionally, do we include civilians that arm themselves, or those in families who travelled with armies as non-combatants? However, using the working definition of understanding warfare as a process that involves a range of things such as the economy and social organisation that brings about wars, and defining civilians as those not travelling with armies, drawing upon a range of examples from eyewitness accounts and prints from the Thirty Years' War and English Civil War, this video cast will address the extent of violence felt by civilians, how civilians impacted warfare, and also at the end probe some further questions into how we should come to explain the violence civilians faced and the larger issues behind this. Ultimately, demonstrating that while civilians were impacted in a number of diverse ways, both their experience of warfare and the actual complexity of warfare itself can't be reduced to a neat singular explanation of there just being barbaric violence from soldiers. It is important to first note what the economic conditions were during the Thirty Years' War and the English Civil War. Because of the difficulties states faced in raising funds to finance armies that often resulted in forces such as Swiss mercenaries and English parliamentary forces being owed millions in pay, soldiers were expected to live off the land and civilians had to pay the cost of, of the army's campaigns through war taxes. What commenced was, as Barbara Donegan skillfully sums up, a rickety equilibrium maintained by soldiers and civilians and a military self-regulation that characterised both of these wars. In practice, for example during the Thirty Years' War, it took the shape of a contribution system that took regular payments from a region under control or threatened by force, which Ruff explains as actually being quite orderly with written agreement between army commanders and local officials. However, this loose agreement extended and blurred into a grey area of what was accepted as common practice if certain towns didn't surrender. In instances like this, a more forceful and violent approach was adopted. For example, in Freiburg and in Chester, in both cases invading forces, taking money and resources, looting and plundering the villages they entered and causing widespread disorder with large numbers of people tragically killed, plundered and left naked where they lay, as one observer reported in Freiburg. Also, as Charles Carlton states, there were also locals who lived in terror of raids and civilians afraid to sleep in their own houses because of English soldiers using extortion to become self-supporting as it was their only option. Or we can see from the account of a shoemaker called Hans Herbele from Nienstetten in Ulm, which although is limited by the fact that it's written from hindsight as a year-by-year -year summary from 1618 to 1672, meaning he is selecting which information he sees as important, he still observed the difficult times experienced, drawing on published reports stating the violence soldiers inflicted onto the people and sufferings and all kinds of maliciousness that cost the community a huge amount. Although the range of violence felt by civilians has gained a lot of attention amongst historians and is hugely significant, it's important to firstly question the evidence we use in uncovering the impact of warfare. For example, as Richard Booney and Mortimer warn, we need to be wary of having a journalistic perspective of the war and how quite often the normal and regular is ignored. We need to be aware of how evidence of these awful atrocities can't alone provide an accurate assessment of the impact of warfare during this period, and there are a number of key issues we need to address. For example, there was a significant geographical variation in the impact warfare had on different places, as many areas such as Kent during the English Civil War, or in northwest of Germany, 
during the Thirty Years' War suffered little damage compared to that of Mecklenburg or Württemberg, for instance. Even the data of such enormous population losses, such as those in Germany, aren't clear, as some of the losses were instead people migrating or fleeing. Additionally, different social classes were impacted differently, like in Nordlingen during the Thirty Years' War. Despite the damage, the wealthiest 2% of its inhabitants almost doubled their wealth by adapting to soldiers' demands for supplies more effectively than the poor. We need to understand warfare as not just a singular force, but also how it contributed to other factors such as the outbreak of disease, like in the English Civil War, where overtly destructive parliamentary tactics worsened the famine and helped the spread of the plague. Understanding this, it demonstrates how our understanding of warfare shouldn't be closed off to such a limited focus on just atrocities committed. We need to embrace its complexity. Additionally, even from the very question itself, the one-way focus it has on warfare's impact on civilians is extremely problematic. It suggests that warfare only ever impacted civilians, and civilians had no impact. However, as previously mentioned, civilians not only contributed to warfare economically through contribution systems, civilians also fought back and were capable of violence. The fraught relationship between civilians and soldiers caused by states' inability to pay soldiers resulted in numerous cases within both wars of peasants fighting drunkenly soldiers or forming small civilian forces and militias in anger against the soldiers plundering and looting their resources or possessions. There are even examples of women civilians inflicting violence, as Lynn explores, in the English Civil War with the good wives of Lyme capturing, robbing and stripping a royalist regiment Irish woman, stuffing her into a barrel studded on the inside with nails and rolling her into the sea where she died. Otto Ulbricht upholds this, stating that civilians were not always that of down-and-out losers, and they often retained a lot of their goods and were prepared for a confrontation with the soldiers, selling their cattle and hiding valuables in advance. Furthermore, within the discussions Donegan raises, exploring military conduct and codes of war, of what is just and binds together the unofficial trust of soldiers, these complex discussions of codes and principles governing soldiers and warfare can be extended to civilians. Throughout the 17th century in early modern Europe, violence was extremely common in everyday life. It was featured within punishments, it was seen as a way to settle domestic disputes, but also violence and killing was an absolutely fundamental aspect of warfare and it drove it. And stemming from even the large ideas of warfare raised by Thomas Hobbes, whether nature is a state of war and how central violence and ultimately war is to life, or the reasons to why war is fought, to settle arguments or for self-protection, we can connect these larger themes of warfare to the civilian. This high and low comparison can also certainly be captured within the Jacques Collot's Miseries of War, where it's not the typical sort of propaganda print popularly juiced during the Thirty Years' War. It was satirical and, as Diane Wolfville states, designed to inflame political passions. Within his prints of the hanging of soldiers, for example, as punishment for the atrocities they committed, Civilians here are seen to take violence into their own hands and deliver consequences to the soldier. And even though these almost definitely aren't direct illustrations of a specific event of war, the fact it's produced to inflame opinions means we can tap into the messages that Callow is trying to disseminate. The clear lack of any type of emblem or uniform and the ambiguity behind his actual messaging of the print as to what form of justice is right to kill soldiers and whether we should be supporting it, exemplifies how the same complex issues behind debates for killings within war and what makes a just war face civilians in their struggle against soldiers. It reinforces how there is no straightforward discussion we can draw with regard to warfare and civilians, and how there shouldn't be a one-way focus simply on warfare's impact, as both are shaped by these larger, complex ideas of justice and violence. Following on from this, there's also a severe problem in the way we should try to explain the violence felt by civilians. For example, when we take Lynn's focus on stressing the importance of new codes of conduct, better supply, pay, food, and standing armies after 1650 in preventing the levels of violence enacted by soldiers, 
We need to get away from such closed, narrow arguments that don't consider the possibility of looking into the larger issues of violence we see within these wars. For example, Ulbricht supports this by raising how there were public displays of violence towards women and how the rape from soldiers was reducing a human being to a mere object, a part of the booty, and was aimed at the deliberate destruction of the fundamental social value of female honour. Also, from the animalistic descriptions of the worthy mother and her sisters driven into the woods like animals in the diary of Clara Steiger, a nun from Marienstein, which was devastated by the Swedish. Despite the limits a diary might present, in that the personal nature of it might distort some of the real facts, it demonstrates how there's a much larger and complex issue of masculine aggression and violence here, beyond just the context of the time, and due to the chaos that warfare brings. Additionally, Michelle Osiokru and Jeremy Black explore how in the English Civil War, parliamentary forces were deliberately targeting a, targeting a civilian population, which in their eyes refused to accept Parliament's military superiority. And in the atrocity of Drogheda, civilians now shared the fate of soldiers. Both emphasise the tactic of targeting civilians during this period of warfare. Yet this again is an issue that has continued beyond 1650 and even within recent wars. And we shouldn't be afraid to extend these problems of violence to more recent examples and demonstrate the wider significance of the issues we are tackling. Although there have been numerous attempts made by historians such as Mortimer and Carlton to focus in on the direct experiences of civilians that unearth great complexity within such individual circumstances, it's also crucial to retain a wider perspective of these issues in order to continue to be able to make new and meaningful insights into what the impact of warfare was on civilians. Overall, this video cast has demonstrated that while civilians face great violence from soldiers, economic impacts in form of war contributions, and that there were a range of different types of violence, Ultimately, such a question and focus as this, asking what warfare's impact was on civilians, needs severe reworking. We need a much more complex understanding of the different experiences different types of warfare can bring, how there wasn't one uniform impact on all civilians that we can reduce to a neat singular explanation. There were much larger, important issues impacting ideas of warfare and civilians. Civilians brutally impacting warfare, and how we should embrace the wider significance of the issues being discussed.